I'm sitting on a rock on the lower slopes of Arunachala. Uh, devotees who are familiar with Bhagavan's pictures might remember there's one. I forget which leg. He has one ankle on his knee and he's holding a stick. It might be the other hand. They can't remember. You see this rock here framed on one side and the peak of Arunachala behind. One of my favorite photos, the favorite photo of many other people. I've put it on the cover of at least one of my books. I've decided to sit on this rock, which is still here, to tell a few stories about what happened when Bhagavan went walking on the hill, mostly in the last quarter century of his life. Be before I do, I just want to put in a word for this rock. Um, I discovered it perhaps 30 years ago and decided not to let anyone know about it simply because I thought if it, if it was too publicly known, somebody might come one night and r run off with it. In, uh, in the late 1980s, the path to Skand Ashram was resurfaced, and the ashram workers who were given the job were scavenging for boulders on either side of the path. And I came up one morning to see what they were doing, and I noticed that they, they'd taken all the rocks up to about six feet in front of me, so I thought, I'm going to protect Bhagavan's rock, that's my job for the day. So I, I, I sat on this rock, and when anyone came with their crowbar or their hammer, I'm saying, sorry, this is Bhagavan's rock, you can't have it. So I, I actually sat on this rock for eight hours one day in the 1980s to make sure it wasn't turned into rubble or paving for the new path to Skandashram. Bhagavan always insisted on having at least two walks on the hill every day. He would have one in the early morning and one in the evening. After lunch, he would usually uh, go to Palakotu, walk through the trees there, meet any devotees, occasionally visit them. But the morning and evening sessions, that was his downtime. That was the time that he was alone with Arunachala. And I think those were the periods that he he was off duty. I think probably of all the times during the day, that was the one time when he could commune with the mountain, his own guru. He had an attendant who came with him to make sure that nobody bothered him. And everybody who was in the ashram was told in no uncertain terms, nobody follows Bhagavan up the hill. You can wait at the back gate and watch him walk down, but his time on the hill is sacrosanct. Nobody should interrupt him. He had stopped going for Pradakshina in 1926. Uh, he didn't go as far as Skand Ashram for a period of about 20 years, so his walks tended to be max maximum half an hour. And Amle Swami told me that he once was persuaded to walk about a mile to see the opening of a new pumping station behind a big lake that was here. On one occasion he went as far as the end of the Samudram Dam to see the overflow. And there's one story that uh, Viswanatha Swami has told, and Anamle Swami also told me, that in 1929, Bhagavan and Ganapati Muni made a semi-secret walk through the forest at the foot of the hill to Katu Siva, which is about a half hour walk from here around the bottom of the hill. Now that um, is an interesting story for me, because Ganapati Muni had had a major Kundalini experience. Uh, he had an opening of his skull on the top of his head, after which he found it very difficult to be in direct sunlight. So the fact that they could walk from Ramanashram to Katu Siva after lunch at the hottest time of the day indicates to me that in those days there was still a residual band of forest at the foot of the hill. I asked uh, Anamle Swami about this. Anamle Swami was Bhagavan's attendant for that particular walk. And he agreed, he said, yes, when I, when I first came, maybe the bottom 100 or 200 feet of the slopes still had some old forest. He said there was a glorious old tree at the back of Pelicotu and just some general South Indian native forest all the way as far as Katu Siva. It was possible to walk there continuously through trees. And that's what uh, Bhagavan and Ganapati Muni did on this day in 1929. 
because Bhagavan had talked to Ganapati Muni about a tree that had been mentioned in some famous Sanskrit work uh, called Ingudi tree and he said, oh, there's one of those at Katu Siva Ashram, let's go and have a look. So they, they secretly went off after lunch one day and Marugana had heard them making their plans and he very much wanted to go for a walk in the forest with Bhagavan but he knew he wasn't invited and he didn't want to mention the subject to Bhagavan in case he was told not to come. So when he discovered that Bhagavan had gone missing and Ganapati Muni wasn't there, he realized this was the day. And just by some strange telepathic intuition, he managed to track Bhagavan, Ganapati Muni and Anamali Swami all the way to Katu Shiva Ashram through quite dense forest that's a distance of a mile and a half in one specific direction and he caught up with them as they were sitting under this tree that Bhagavan had taken Ganapati Muni to see. These long trips were more or less exceptions to the rule. The general routine, Bhagavan would come up here after breakfast, he would walk maybe 10-15 minutes, he would sit on a rock such as this, then he would go back and start his daily routine in the ashram. After lunch, he would go and visit devotees in Pelicatu, or he would just uh, wander through Pelicatu, a different route every day. And of course, everybody there was hoping that uh, it was going to be their lucky day that Bhagavan would stop by, say hello, have a few words with them. There were some people in Pelicatu who, for various reasons, were not allowed into the ashram. So this was the only chance they ever got to see Bhagavan. Bhagavan knew this and if they had been exiled from the ashram for any reason, he would make a point of stopping by their hut, saying hello, and giving them a few words of encouragement. The one thing you couldn't do when Bhagavan was walking in Palakotu was make any attempt to make him welcome. Uh, S.S. Cohen discovered this. He said, he said he had a porch which offered some shade from the sun in summer, and that occasionally when Bhagavan was walking that way, he would come and sit on the porch, have a little rest and then get up and carry on. So Cohen would peep through his window and have his private darshan of Bhagavan sitting on his veranda and be very happy. And then uh, he made a mistake. He put a chair out there just in case Bhagavan happened to be coming that way away. He thought it was more respectful to have a chair there in case Bhagavan came. Bhagavan took one look at it, walked on, and never sat on that veranda again. The, w the one thing you couldn't do when Bhagavan was out walking was show some sign that you're expecting him, and you definitely couldn't make any attempt to make him more comfortable. If you did, that was probably the last time you ever saw him in your house. Chadwick, Major Chadwick, made an even more foolish attempt to get Bhagavan into his house. Chadwick was very attached to the idea of having some kind of formal recognition that Bhagavan was his guru. I think he came from a, a background where you, you really did need to have a guru who said he was your guru and who had given you some kind of formal initiation as a recognition you were now his devotee or disciple. Bhagavan, of course, never said he was a guru and he never formally initiated anyone. So Chadwick was feeling a bit left out. He, he wanted some kind of sign that there was a formal connection between the two. So he persuaded Bhagavan's attendant on one of his lunchtime walks. He said, sometimes he comes back through my corner of the ashram. When he does, why don't you suggest that he come in and sit there and may maybe I can get him to give me formal initiation by put putting his hand on my head. Now, I have to say, I thought Chadwick should have known better than that he would get away with something like this. But Bhagavan somehow got wind that Chadwick was waiting for him, that he wanted to ambush him and com compel him to give some formal initiation by touch. And he wouldn't even follow his usual route that day. He took a route that was so clearly avoiding anywhere within hailing distance of Chadwick's house that Chadwick realized that he knew that he was waiting there to ambush him and demand this initiation. And after that, he dropped the idea. So you could wait for Bhagavan to come. You could hope he would talk to you. He might sit on your veranda, but any sign 
that you knew he was coming, that you were trying to make him comfortable, or any attempt to get him into your house to do something, and quite likely that would be the last time you'd ever see him. Now there are a few instances of devotees in extreme situations flouting the ashram rules and getting away with it because the circumstances merited it. As I said, the attendant's job was to discourage devotees from coming anywhere near Bhagavan on his walks. But perhaps the, the story that I like the most is of a military convoy of British soldiers which was on its way to Bangalore and they were driving past the ashram. One of the enlisted men had heard about Bhagavan, was attracted to him, but under the, the military rules in force in India at that time, there was no possibility that he could get leave to come and visit Bhagavan in Tiruvannamalai. So he had one chance and one chance only to have darshan, and that was to persuade the driver of the truck he was in to speed ahead as he was approaching Raman Ashram, drop him off, and then run through the ashram as fast as he could, prostrate to Bhagavan, ru run out again, and his driver was going to loiter at the back of the convoy, and he was going to jump on the back of the truck and car carry on his way to Bangalore. So that might have worked, except Bhagavan was off on one of his walks when the soldier ran in, in full military uniform, shouting, where's Bhagavan, where's Bhagavan? I've got 30 seconds, where is he? And everybody said he's walking on the hill without mentioning that he wasn't allowed to follow. So this, this soldier was in no mood to be stopped by anyone. He charged all the way through the ashram, out the back, and he found Bhagavan in Palakatu with an Amle Swami. He's the one who told me the story. Now, in the early days of the ashram, the ashram didn't even have toilets. And so Bhagavan was squat, squatting behind a bush in Palakatu doing his business and an Amle Swami was standing guard. And this British soldier in full British military regalia threw himself full length on the floor at Bhagavan's feet and said, Bhag Bhagavan, I only have a few seconds with you, please bless me. Now, of course, Bhagavan never blessed people overtly, but he, he smiled at the devotee and just showed some indication that uh, he'd given his blessings in a non-physical, non non-verbal way. The soldier got up, he raced back down to the road and the, the loitering truck at the back of the convoy waited, he jumped on and was never seen again. And Bhagavan mentioned to Anamle Swami on the way back that he was, he was a good devotee with a burning desire to see the Guru and that showed, he said he has a very difficult karma, this is his only opportunity in this life to come and see me. He took advantage of it, he came and that's, that's his blessing, he got his blessing. Namo Ramanaya Nalam Peravarna Vimochanamiyam Virayman If you were a very close devotee of Bhagavan, then it was occasionally permitted that, that if you had some private business you wanted to discuss, you could follow him up the hill. That was a, a right and a privilege restricted to very few, but it did occasionally happen. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of Papaji, who had been told by Devaraja Mudalia that he should go back to the Punjab and rescue his family in 1947 because they were marooned on the wrong side of the new international boundary. He wanted to plead his case with Bhagavan, so he followed Bhagavan up the hill in July 1947 and explained his predicament. Bhagavan always insisted that family people should look after their family without exception. Papaji said, but to me, Bhagavan, they're all a dream. My whole past life before I came to you is a dream. I'm so attached to your form, I'm so in love with your form, there's no possibility that, that I can tear myself away from it. And Bhagavan said, if it's such, if you regard it as a dream, why should you be afraid of the dream? What, what is there to fear in a dream? You have to go and do your duty. But remember, he said, I am with you wherever you are. That was his 
final blessing, his final benediction to Papaji, that he ordered him to go back and rescue his family, which he did, and said, I am with you wherever you are. Papaji prostrated to him on the hill. He took a pinch of soil from under Bhagavan's feet and kept it as the dust from the Guru's feet, went off, rescued his family, and never got the opportunity to come back again because after partition he spent the next three years looking after his family in Lucknow. There is one other story of a devotee who, how we say, was allowed to come or the, the, his desire was so strong to see Bhagavan that nothing could stop him from meeting him on the hill. This is a version of a Robert Adams story that doesn't appear to be in any of the accounts of his meetings with Bhagavan that have appeared in all the various audio tapes and online transcripts. It was told to me by a close devotee of his who ended up writing uh, a short biographical screenplay of how Robert Adams came to Tirunamale and how he met Bhagavan. Robert Adams was a teenage boy, I think he was only 18 years old when he first came to Bhagavan. He'd been sent here by Yogananda, Paramahamsa Yogananda in California, who said that he should go to Tiruvannamalai and that Bhagavan was his guru. He arrived. Oh, I, I should mention that uh, Robert Adams was already in an extremely advanced state. Uh, in his young, younger life, he discovered that he had this city, this supernatural power, that whatever he, whatever he said out loud manifested. So he said, this is, this is the perfect supernatural power for a kid to have. You could stand outside the candy store and say, candy, candy, and the candy would appear in his hand. And he said, whenever, whenever he had tests at school, he never had to do any homework. He would just sit down and say, answer, answer and his pen would scribble the right answer. So he went through life having it very easy. And then at some point in his early teens, I think he was doing another test. And instead of saying answer, answer, he made the mistake, shall we, or possibly not a mistake, of saying God, God, God. And uh, instead of getting the answer to his test, he actually got the experience of God. He said, this, this had never occurred to me before, but as soon as I said, God, 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 I actually entered the state of godliness. I had the God experience and it stayed with me. He said, That's, that was the beginning, the middle and end of my sadhana. I just randomly said, God, 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 when I was a teenager, I had the experience. But my, my feeling is there was something that wasn't totally complete. I think if you are still hungering for a guru, if you need to go to look for someone outside of yourself, then there's something that's not complete, something is not final. So he went to first uh, a Christian mystic called Joel Goldsmith, then he went to Paramahamsa Yogananda, and finally he came to Bhagavan here around 1947. He arrived with no... He said, I didn't have a plan. I, was, I didn't think of this in advance, but I arrived in Tiruvannamalai. I was told Bhagavan was walking on the hill and he said, suddenly I don't know what came over me. I, I rushed up the hill, I found where Bhagavan was and with no prior um, decision, no thought about it, I took all my clothes off. I had this peculiar idea, just in, on the spur of the moment, that I should present myself stark naked to my guru and prostrate at his feet with no clothes on. He, he said it was a completely mad idea, I don't know why I did it. He said, I just felt compelled that as I threw myself at the feet of my guru, I had to be absolutely physically naked as well as mentally naked. I think Bhagavan could see what an advanced state he was in, so he didn't mind this crazy teenager stripping off and prostrating in front of him. He helped him to his feet, he got him dressed, he took him to the ashram. And then, interestingly, this was a time in Bhagavan's life when lots and lots of people were in the ashram and on the whole, new people weren't getting a lot of personalized attention. He said that Bhagavan gave him a room in the ashram, made sure he had a place to stay. And even better than that, he brought, he brought food to his room and personally served him to make sure he was 
being properly looked after in the ashram. I think that's uh, an indication that Bhagavan knew this man was in a very high state and that his, his thirst for a guru, his god intoxication had caused him to run up the hill, break the ashram rules, break all kinds of rules by stripping off and throwing himself at Bhagavan's feet. But when, when these things happened, Bhagavan could see that there was a spiritual maturity that was the motivating factor he didn't mind. Namo Ramanaya Nalam Now there's one story, it's a long and complicated, but it's my all-time favorite story about Bhagavan on the hill, because it illustrates so many good points about how Bhagavan rooted for the underdog in one sense, how he cared for the apparently insignificant devotees, and how if you really depended Bhagavan on Bhagavan and trusted him, he would be there for you. Now in, in 1945, Bhagavan either broke a toe or severely sprained it. It swelled up to a huge size and he couldn't walk on it properly. He was ordered by his doctor to limit his movement. He was allowed to go to the bathroom, to the dining room and back to the old hall and that was that. Now T.P. Ramachandra Iyer, who was the ashram lawyer and a friend of his, wanted to go to Skandashram after a lunch. And this was about three weeks after Bhagavan had damaged his toe. So in, in those days it was traditional to tell Bhagavan if you were going off on a trip and to ask his permission. So they went up to Bhagavan after lunch and said, Bhagavan, we'd like to go to Skandashram, may we have your permission? And Bhagavan looked rather wistfully at them and said, Oh, what a good idea. Will you, will you take me with you? And TPR, he was absolutely horrified, as, as was Rangaswamy, the attendant, who was under, under orders from the doctor to minimize movement from Bhagavan. So everyone said, No, no, you can't possibly do that. You've been told to rest. There's no way that your, your damaged toe would get you up to Skandashram and back. So Bhagavan looked at his attendant and said rather mournfully, they don't, want to, they don't want to take us, they're not going to allow us to come with, it, to come with them. So um, Ramachandra went, started to walk up the hill and then after some time they stopped and they saw Bhagavan and Rangaswami starting to climb the hill. So because this was towards the end of the month that Bhagavan had been prohibited from walking on the hill, they thought nothing of it. They just thought, oh, Bhagavan's trying out his toe to see if he can manage walking on the hill again. Then Bhagavan disappeared from view. Rangaswami came up and said, it's all right, we're not following you. We're just going for a little walk. Uh, when I take Bhagavan back to the hall, uh, I'll come with you to Skandashram. Please, please wait for me. I won't be long. So they sat on a rock waited and waited and waited. Uh, nothing happened. Rangaswami didn't reappear. And then a watchman who was looking after Skandashram appeared. He had been asked to take some food to a sadhu who was then living in Skandashram. So Ramachandra asked, well, have you seen Rangaswami? He's supposed to be joining us. Is anybody else on the path? And the food courier looked a bit um, uneasy and said no and they thought oh, he's, he's covering up here so they asked again and they said well actually Bhagavan is slowly slowly coming up with Rangaswami his attendant so Ramachandra thought well this is terrible um, rushed down the hill and they found Bhagavan in an extremely uh, fragile state this was a hot time of the year it was after after lunch he was so uh, enfeebled by his month of inactivity 
that he wasn't able to walk by himself anymore. He was actually crawling on his hands and knees. He had cuts on his palms, he had cuts on his toes, and apparently sweat, sweat was pouring off his body. And Rangaswamy, the attendant, was pleading with him, saying, Bhagavan, you can't, uh, you can't deal with this. You haven't, you haven't walked on the hill for a month. Your body's not up to this. We have to go back. And Bhagavan absolutely refused. He said, no, no, I'm going to Skandashram. I have to go to Skandashram. So in, in the face of this refusal to go back down the hill, Rangaswami and Ramachandra they lifted him up by the armpits on either side, and they more or less dragged him to Skandashram, where, where he collapsed on the ground. There was a worker there who had been doing some work for the ashram, and Bhagavan asked him uh, if he had any, anything to eat, and the, the worker was a little bit embarrassed because he'd already eaten his lunch, and Bhagavan said, ne never mind, maybe there's something left in your bowl you can give me, just mix it with a little water and I'll take that. So the man had, had eaten some kind of sticky porridge and the residue was adhering to the side of the bowl. So this was taken to the Skandashram spring, it was mixed up with a little water, and Bhagavan drank this very, very diluted porridge mix and started to recover. Then um, Bhagavan turned to this man whose porridge leftovers he'd eaten and said, I came here because of you. I came because you prayed to me. And the man was absolutely delighted. And of course, everybody else was wondering what's going on. What, why has Bhagavan almost killed himself to come up here on a hot day when he was under doctor's orders to stay in the ashram? And then Bhagavan, of course, realized that the other people didn't have access to the knowledge that he did. He said, we were in the new hall, uh, four pillars had just been finished and there was a puja going on to consecrate these four new pillars. This man from Skandashram was standing in the crowd there watching me uh, go with the priests as they went round these pillars one by one and blessed them. And this man had the thought, these are important people, they have their work blessed by Bhagavan. I'm repainting Skandashram, I'm whitewashing Skandashram. Bhagavan never comes to Skandashram. How, how can I ever get him to appreciate what I've done because he never comes up here anymore? So somehow, telepathically, Bhagavan tuned into this and despite his absolute physical inability to make the trip, he went there on his bleeding hands and knees. He almost collapsed simply because one man had made an unconscious mental plea or complaint to himself and to Bhagavan that he was working, working very hard, he was also doing stuff for the ashram and that no one was appreciating him or his work. Bhagavan tuned into that and absolutely defied all instructions to the contrary and almost killed himself getting up to Skand Ashram so that he could give darshan to this man and give him the satisfaction of having his own work inspected and approved by Bhagavan. Namo Ramanayana Lampera Varga Vimochana Meyan Virai Malakkar Varga Namo Ramanayana Lampera Varga Vimochanamayan, 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 Vimochanamayan,